I was told by one of our younger employees that this meme is too old and too American, but I decided to put it in anyways. This is the Captain Planet by our powers combined. Somebody asked, what are the best practices? And again, we're a little bit, this is all on you, but there are a set of technologies, some of which Sarah has already discussed, and best practices which the field has been coalescing about and becoming increasingly standard across institutions. And because they're being used across institutions and because they're related to linked open data, that means that whenever one institution uses it, it adds value potentially across all of the institutions. There's still a lot of work to be done, not only getting stuff in, but it's already allowing incredible things to happen. And I think I will actually show you my proposal for the Ethiopian Manuscript Binding Database, just an example of what was completely impossible five years ago, but which is, I think, a fantastic use of the technology. It's not what you want to do, because obviously it's what I want to do. But you might have something that is so similar in conception that, you know, that is exactly what you can do. And that's because we have TEI, right? We've been talking about it. it's our shared interchange format. You can add stuff to other people's stuff. You can make a copy of their stuff, inject it into your stuff, and actually say, I'm interested in different things, but I've got the catalog data from the owning library. IIIF, the International uh, Image Interoperability Framework, um, gets around the big issue of libraries like to own, sorry, I was about to say pretend to own, the images of their uh, items and don't want somebody else to host them. So they host them themselves, but we now have this extremely powerful way to say, this is still on your server, you still own it, but it's going to appear in my project as an integral part. So every image you saw in the um, SOP stuff that I was showing, the Syriac stuff, on every actual image that appears on Agam's project is hosted by IIIF. And you cannot at first glance tell whether we host it on our IIIF server or Monasterium hosts it on their IIIF server or the University of Hamburg hosts it on the Ben server or the British Library hosts it on the Endangered Archives program server because the way that we are presenting it, the images look the same, and it's actually the credit and surrounding data that tells you what it is. I have it set up for one of my projects. Whenever you click on it, it goes back to the original document that it's taken from. You know, you can put all the things down there, but this allows us to do things that, when I started my PhD, which was, I wanna say, not that long ago, back when everything was microfilm, when requesting images from the British Library was like pulling teeth, requesting images from the Vatican Library was change your research project. Um, this is transformational. So we have TEI, TEI can describe things like page breaks, page beginnings actually it's called in TEI, and it can associate it with a specific set of files that are in that facsimile uh, thing that we talked about. We have text in the TEI, suddenly we have facing page translations that automatically scroll with them. We have ability to describe relationships uh, in terms of the uh, visible space on the page on somebody else's images, either with TEI zones or IIIF annotations, depending on what your project needs. There's all kinds of amazing things this is already allowing us to do. And because of some of the technical things behind it, there are a lot of cases where it actually is very not costly from a bandwidth perspective. There's other ways you can do it, which are resource hogs, but it's not like you're pulling down the entire manuscript necessarily every time you check one line on one page. FAIR, Sarah talked about the FAIR principles. These are promoting reuse, discovery, all these things which allow one project to benefit from the research of another project. 
RDF, RDF, the research descript resource description framework, is the basis of what we call linked open data or the semantic web. It allows us to do things like take controlled vocabularies that the Getty is producing and use them in our documents so that they are controlled and linkable back to the same set of controlled vocabularies that other projects are using. So together we're creating a larger amount of data which is theoretically, not always practically, but theoretically uh, discoverable across multiple projects. And that's something that's uh, ongoing work. In XSLP, uh, an older technology, but the one we were just talking about, is essentially our way for taking all this content stuff, making it presentational, doing the transformations to take the stuff we're putting in the repository and putting it in the display presentational mode because that's how most of us are going to interact with it. And today, I didn't know what to put down here. I put digital edition. Uh, this was obviously gimmick first and <laughs> the actual, uh, what happened later, but whatever you want to think about, I kind of just thought like modern DH practices, but there's a lot of not DH practices, it would not be this. There's other things we could add. D3, which is a JavaScript framework for making uh, data visualization, um, is another thing which allows us to uh, automatically present new views on large corpuses of data that you might include here. And so this last little bit today, I wanted to talk about some of these ways that we can use and link the data in ways that enrich it. Uh, our institute leader has something that Sarah already mentioned out, mentioned called uh, the uh, a certification. I'm sorry. I. I edited this paper for uh, grammar and I'm just completely blanking because I'm on video, of course, um, which is about different ways that we can embed declarations of fact in there. Sarah's already mentioned that, but I just wanted to pull out an example which I thought was quite nice from uh, some of the materials we looked at. Whereas you see this, it's in Latin. You might be interested in all the herbs here, but maybe you're not great at Latin um, and uh, maybe you're just not interested in all the herbs. You just want to know what does somebody say about onions across lots of editions, right? So currently you have to go to every edition that might have onions in it and search for onions. But if we say here that we have actually marked up this with a link back to controlled, vocabula controlled vocabularies that tell us that this is onion. This allows us to do a lot of things. It allows us to immediately make multilingual search. Uh, we can implement a variety of technologies that link these multilingual things, or we can link back to something like Wikidata, which has a controlled uh, number that represents onion across all kinds of different sources on the internet very uh, diverse, not just in manuscripts, and potentially will link it to a lot there. And uh, here we have made editorial decisions. I've drawn a box around this, and I have decided that this is a picture of an onion and not a picture of chervil, which is what this other thing is. I could be wrong. Maybe I don't know what chervil looks like, but I am reasonably certain from looking at this that I think this is an onion and not chervil. Um, but if, by drawing this box around it, I've told potentially uh, computers doing computer vision that later come in and say, suck down all the images that are of onions, right? That this is an onion and not chervil. So potentially I might have put in wrong data there. Other uh, projects are doing it from the other end. They've already got tons of images which have been, they've been told are onions, so they might be looking at this distantly, and the computer might be drawing the box and saying, based upon all the other pictures of onions that you know, we've processed in a hundred dimensional space, 
we think this is an onion, not chervil. So there's kind of two ends that we're coming at this from, but they're very linked. Uh, machine vision's way outside of this particular school, but it's something that we need to think about is that when we make declarations in discoverable ways, we are also potentially uh, improving the way that other projects can learn about these materials or that people from completely unrelated fields could discover them. Like, I don't know, you're an agricultural scientist and suddenly you can pull up like all of the historical information about your specific set of crops that you're interested in. I don't know if that is particularly useful or if it's just interesting, but it's the kind of thing that I would like us to be able to do and I think is something that we can deliver in a digital humanities context. So here also, I just did three languages that are relevant to this. And of course, Wikidata has all of these languages controlled in many more languages than I can. But you can put this in as many languages as probably your users are going to come in and use, or you can pull from somebody else's authority file where they have done that work for you. Because of the way this data is linked, it works both ways and allows you to do different things. Normally our practice is to maintain our own local authority file, which we use as an intermediary to external authority files, just because that way we know we are controlling our data in the way that we think it should be controlled. We are linking it to data, which then might actually be linked to other people's project, which perhaps were done in a way that we disagree with or is actually wrong. So by having this intermediate layer, but then also linking it to the external files, uh, we are saying something about our organization of the data as well as what we think about how it relates to the external data. So again, this is our colleagues at Koroma, Cooking Recipes of the Middle Ages, uh, and they have taken this kind of markup that they've done, which you saw highlighted uh, in the version that Sarah showed, and they have pulled it out by those highlighted uh, uh, ingredients, and you can search all the recipes by the ingredient, and again, it links directly to the Wikidata, um, and also, through that, it links to categories from different other controlled vocabularies, different ways of organizing knowledge, so that we have an ability to search these manuscripts through many different vectors depending upon what we're interested in. And that goes along with their facing page translation, which again, even if all your TEI file did was have an MS identifier, had the text the page breaks in a way of associating those page breaks with the facsimile files, you can do beautiful facing page scrolling additions like you see here, where as you scroll down, the page pops over. And uh, I think that's actually worth demonstrating. It's a fairly common thing that people do in the field, uh, but it is nevertheless uh, a very nice usable interface. Uh, for this. And of course the inverse way is you click a button and you advance the page and the text at the same time. These are just presentational decisions, right? You have made a, C, a TEI file that allows you to do this and then at presentation level you can choose how you're going to present this because it's been encoded in a way that associates the facsimile, uh, whether a local file or a IIIF file with this page in the uh, manuscript. And they have, of course, through various coloration and symbols and embedding of link, embedded a lot of additional information which might be useful uh, to the reader. So you get to say in the text all kinds of things that might be invisible to the reader until they go look for it or might be very visible as we are clearly marking this as something which we have done as um, one of our interventions. And 
this is like embedding all these elements of apparatus directly into the text. And of course, depending on the presentation, you can just turn all this off. So let me go back to the slides. So, um, and here, kind of on the same topic, I just wanted to go back to this idea of the minimal versus the maximal examples and how just because you can do something fancy, you don't always need to. So here we have, again, the onion, and here we have these uh, paragraph markers that have A, B, C, D, you know. Well, we all know, depending upon how our edition is set up, we might want to represent these differently, right? Because sometimes we care about indexing materials like this as part of material culture of printing, in which case the fact that they're in the margin and they're indexed in this way might be interesting. Sometimes people are just making a text edition that's readable, in which case there is nothing that is wrong with changing those paragraph markers to A, B, C, D. That's a lot of these early text editions we might have seen on the internet might have made decisions just like that. I can already see some grimaces out there that some people don't like that process. It is not generally how we would do it. We would generally do something more complicated like this, which associates um, the FW, the, uh, which is, if you look it up in the TEI, it describes this exact type of uh, description in the margin or other uh, area of part of the text. And in this case, I'm saying it's an A and it's in the right margin and it describes this paragraph and I'm showing the paragraph marker. But again, that is 100% a critical editorial decision that depends upon what is your edition and what is important to you while encoding. This is what I would probably do if I was making like an edition for some kind of critical purpose. But if I was presenting this to my students as a reading, I would 100% be changing to something like this because this is what I would consider an actual usable edition to be. And something I might do is I might encode it in the TEI like this and then convert it in the presentation to something like this because this is how I would actually expect students to read it. But that, again, is a critical decision that I'm making and which I might be completely wrong on, or I might be wrong on for your use, or I might be wrong on my use and I just don't know it. Um, locating things on the page is also something that is supported by TEI, which relates to this idea of how we link data together and goes back to that question that I was getting earlier about well, how do we say that this hand describes these, right? And we talked about locus groups. Locus groups are basically groups of page numbers in computable, readable ways. Zones are boxes or arbitrary shapes that describe the space on the image in a computer readable way, which then you can change into something that appears on the page like this. This is actually just me drawing a box in PowerPoint, but the idea is completely the same. It's a presentation element based upon the CEI, a TEI. Um, or uh, you can run a simple conversion and change that into a IIIF annotation using the dedicated IIIF annotation module, which would appear in your IIIF viewer using the native way of drawing boxes uh, on it. So um, the advantage of doing it with zone is stronger when you have the images yourself and they accompany the uh, file, right? Because you always know that they're going to describe this set of images which are in this folder that you're delivering to people, right? If you're only going to be able to interact with an image through somebody else's IIIF link, then it may make a lot more sense for your workflow to use IIIF native material. But then, of course, 
uh, you are dependent upon that IIIF resource uh, being up indefinitely. But that is just an underlying problem with the way the IIIF and this way that we have developed of linking data and sharing it without sharing the original files works. And so we are trusting the libraries which are sharing their material via IIIF to keep their IIIF servers up, to not change the ratio of their images, which happened at least once with a project that we were working with, and to do a variety of other things that make it stable in a long-term way. There are definitely, yes? Oh, sorry, No, I'm here to. I just want to make sure I understand. So if you are um, doing the markup yourself with an image that you have, so you're not doing it through AAA, you can do that in Oxygen itself, or you do it in Photoshop and then you Here's a plugin which is probably the easiest way to do it called the Image Market Plugin. And in Oxygen, when you go to install plugins or whatever it's called, it's one of the drop down menus. It's one of the default ones that should always appear. And it really is as simple as you drag a box and it writes these numbers here, which describe the relationship of that box is corners to the page. Mm -hmm. There's a way to do more complex shapes as well. Just to make sure, you would type maximally and then you would type surface and then you would drag the box and it would fill the rest of it. You would actually, in the Image Magic plugin, which is on the side of Oxygen, click on it, open the image. Mm -hmm. The image would appear there. Mm -hmm. You would make sure that you are in the correct element or that you're in a scratch file, which is actually what I did. Uh, and then I just copied it over into the right place in mine. That's not a great workflow, but I was doing this for one image. Um, and then um, whatever you draw on that box, whether you got it right or not, will immediately appear in your TEI file. You can just delete it at that point. It doesn't uh, make anything permanent. And I was like, not going to do it's a digital file. You can just write it any time. But that is one way of doing it. Uh, zone and triple IF have opposite corners, I believe. So we have a little XSLT that converts one coordinate system to the other. And I am not myself familiar enough with making arbitrary shapes in triple IF. There's an excellent triple IF Slack uh, where you can learn uh, stuff like this. You're, get references to other people implementing it in their project, and they're very helpful. I highly recommend it. While I'm recommending stuff, I think it's in one of my slides, but the TEI mailing list is where to go for insider long experience of how people have been using and intend to use the triple IF. And so this is, yes? So just wondering with your insecurity in binding, ah. is, that, is, is that better than zoning in a similar way with triple IF and So since the entire project is intended to work on other people's data via triple IF, my default is that I would prefer uh, until I have a reason otherwise to use the triple IF. And so that is uh, uni dash at slash oops Let's make sure I know the name of my own project yes this is like a prototype of a prototype this has not been funded this was just us showing this works you can really do this we have a tool that will do it is that tool great no but here for example is the presentation of our, my uh, simple knowledge organization system, controlled vocabulary. It's a, it's a simple type of RDF that really is just for controlled vocabulary, it's not for more complex things like you use OWL for. And I have this annotation tool, and I don't have a collection loaded right now. I, I can find a collection, but in this tool, you load the collection. You select a manifest from there, 
There's an EAP one that I usually have in by default, but I have to actually paste in every time. Um, it will pull out every single manuscript in that manifest, however many have been put in by the people who provide it or by the automatic uh, harvesting that we use. And then uh, this is just a normal Mirador viewer, which I should probably just load up in a moment. But I wanted to show you what actually comes out of it. Uh, and what comes out of it currently, and again, this is not fancy, this is not a finished website in any way, this is me testing it out, is we have the higher level organization of the data. And so if we choose, say here, the X-shaped tool family, we then immediately get to see what are all the different things that have been cataloged as children in the controlled vocabulary of X-shaped tools. And here I am going to choose this one called OXO, which I have cataloged for demonstration purposes of only once. However, something like circle and circle, I have cataloged many times. You can see that the quality of the images, especially since many of these were taken in field conditions in Ethiopia in variable light, are not amazing, but they are enough to consistently tell that these are the same relationship of the tool and for someone to look at it afterwards and say, you know, uh, I think this one's different. It's not, but uh, it's like whichever one is there. And as part of the process of marking them up, I did exactly that. I marked up a bunch of things. I'm like, oh, these are different. I need to do it. In fact, if you want to see a problem with the data, the palm-shaped tool um, is somewhere in there. And it has things that are just completely unrelated, including a modern palm-shaped tool on an Islamic manuscript that happened to be in one of the ancient archive program uh, manifests that I was using. And I thought, well, if it's in the manifest, I've committed to doing this fond, so I should do it, even if it is somewhat odd in this case. Uh, Preliminary version on the ontology workflow. Where is my document? Uh, sorry, I didn't preload this, and I should have, but uh, I can demonstrate it. And uh, the interesting thing is that this annotation tool is the exact one that I used to make all of those. Uh, paleographic analysis you saw because all it does is it lo loads the manifest, you choose a page, it draws a box, and the box then automatically uh, gets outputted in this field with the correct information to describe that box and then whatever information you have associated with there. It's a super quick, easy workflow. Um, and uh, you know, you don't have to use it for Ethiopian binding, obviously, because I was using it for paleographic stuff. Um, but um, what is important there is not necessarily anything that's being done. You can do that with zone. You can do that a variety of ways. You can type in the coordinates yourself. What is not, what's good about what was there when it's working is how fast it is, right? We pull in a manifest which is provided to us, which describes an entire font of a collection, right? We sort out the manuscripts in there in a pull down, so we can just pop through them. We pull to the end usually, because the Endangered Archive program almost always has the covering material in the last few images. Uh, I actually wrote a little plugin that actually reverses them for exactly this reason, so I had to do even less work. Click on one of the covers, check them, draw a box, choose which tool it is in my ontology, or uncategorize, which means I need to go back and actually figure out what it is, and then click a button, it pulls from the manifest um, what the actual information about the manuscript is, and it pulls from the ontology uh, what the category of the tool is, and it pulls from that box the specific um, zone in the IIIF, and I will go back because this is actually worth mentioning that when you pull something through IIIF, you uh, 
only pull the part that you tell it to. So if we go here and we go to the database search and we select a tool and we look at this, let's open this in a new tab. That is how much data we are pulling from the British Library server every time we load this. So I can pull a thousand tool shapes and I'm pulling about like one or two pages worth of actual data because I am only pulling the pixels that are things. And if the British Library server is implemented correctly, which it probably is, they're caching all this data anyway, so it's even less strain on their server to serve this up, right? So I'm not pulling down an entire manuscript every time. I'm pulling a little tiny zone. I'm pulling it from Princeton. I'm pulling it from the British Library. I'm pulling it from our servers. I'm pulling it from Hamburg servers. They're all there. Then you can go back. And this is actually uh, where this manuscript lives. Uh, there's going to be catalog data that shows with like people's actual logos in any non-development version that says like this manuscript lives at the British Library and whatnot. But again, this is purely for development at this point, which is why it embarrassingly doesn't work. But there's all kinds of things you could do, like all those little manicules throughout uh, manuscript 32 well, maybe what you really want to do, ah, it's almost like I planned this, uh, is talk about what did this reader find interesting in this manuscript? So what you really need is a really fast way to mark up regions in order to point to things like the manicule and the highlighting in order to say that these are areas where you should go look because this reader was there. Doing that is trivial in terms of the technology. It is not trivial in terms of your time. So a workflow like Madguas is about making something that takes a time-consuming project that is worthwhile but lengthy doable on scale, right? So I did about 85 manuscripts from one font of the EAP over a couple days, right? Versus I went to, well, I can't go to the British Library and get the Endangered Archive Program manuscripts because they're not there. They're in various Ethiopian collections. But, you know, if I go to the British Library and go to the African Asia reading room, First, I would have to negotiate to get out all the manuscripts, which is not normally possible. I've done it once. Um, and then you can have one manuscript at a time. You have all of these slow processes that I have been doing for many years describing these things. And here, we just zip through them and they've already provided the image permissions for this specific use. We link back to them according to the terms of use of the IIIF service. And therefore, we have what we need. And eventually, when it's done, we have created data, which because it is available in IIIF, because it's highly structured, because it says it is associated with that British Library record, and they can discover it using their information we can then associate it right back with their records if they want to do that. So on one level, I can maintain a database that describes their material at a distance. But on the other hand, they can say, we want that material and just pull it down. They can pull it down automatically uh, or they can pull it down when they choose you know, through basically running a batch script. So this is something I'd like people to think about the linked open data aspect of current digital humanities proce uh, processes, the amazing things that IIIF is enabling for us when we think about how to interact with data. So we are describing in MS Desk the catalog data, we are describing in text, the actual text, we are associating that with manuscripts that we don't have 
you know, the rights to host our own images for, but we have been provided with, we can provide the same image across many manuscripts on the same page and then associate them with the manuscript data that we've pulled down or we've provided ourselves. We can draw zones to show the same letter across many different hands, many different manuscripts. These are the kind of things that we are just now able to do. Absolutely not able to do anymore. The next stage, of course, is going to be things like handwritten text, uh, handwriting text recognition, which I believe is going to be touched upon in the transcribus section tomorrow, which we're currently very interested in because, as I said, we have 600,000 charters that nobody's transcribed for the most part and nobody's going to transcribe <laughs> in any reasonable time frame. So how can we at least get an idea of what's written in them? And that might just be, can we make a search that is fuzzy enough that if we want to look for something, it gives us, say, look at these 200 charters. We think with 80% certainty that your term might be in them. 200 charters is something that you as a human can go look at and work with for a PhD project, for a research project. 600,000 charters, not a chance, right? So these are, that's the next frontier, I think, of what we're doing with manuscripts in uh, the digital humanities. But what's here with the IIIF? What big institutions with departments uh, are doing with it already is amazing. Yeah, you get to see some of these uh, images that would previously essentially been impossible. These giant scrolls, which are now basically in a window that you can drag through and you can look at in different layers of detail. They're incredibly high resolution, but they're only serving you the amount that you need at that particular view. So they're bandwidth friendly, both to the sender and receiver. These are things that you don't have to do, but you should think about how can these things enable for our materials new use, how can they create for our users exciting new projects, maybe projects that we haven't imagined. I don't think when the British Library put up the Endangered Archives Program manuscripts via IIIF, they ever expected me to draw tiny 200 maximum pixel boxes around them and serve a thousand at a time. But they made that exactly possible. I talked to actually one of the founders of IIIF who works at Princeton, so like I didn't, ever see this specific project, but I think that is exactly something that we should be doing with IIIF. We see other projects doing kind of similar things. Now, um, there's so many possibilities, and it's your imagination, and it's your research project, and it's your time and funding, which are the limiting factors. So with that, I am at five o'clock exactly. I would like to invite questions and uh, thank you all for uh, your attention.